this is DNA, I'm probably the best gift I could give to people, is that not this is language and architecture was different, so I'm going to kind of go through the DNA. Or, and this is the second part, Anton Refugé did do some work with Latinus, as well as 14 other artists at the Americana, and it was destroyed. But the work was saved, and I can tell you the story about the salvaging of that one places because that um, the Americana was a hotel that had no less than 15 artists involved in the making of the interior of that So there were two ideas I had about how to present it. It's either give you the DNA on Lapidus and then go into the different artists at the Americana. And I wasn't sure what made sense for everyone, but um, my thought was I've got about 120 uh, slides that I put together to talk about the nitpicking the architecture of Laura's office in the last eight buildings, and then uh, kind of nitpicking the process of working on the places in the project of the event. So the, which way do we go first? Oh, so style, um, as Morris said, it's not permanent. We said beauty, that was what Trudy is called the light is. So Mr. Lapp is always, whenever we would do things together, we're sort of always going back to um, firmness, fitness, and delight. And, um, I actually think that that sums up more than anything what he was trying to do with his architectural style, which was always find that element of delight. So we're always going to be looking for something delightful. The next one. Um, so this is the last of a series of five that are lectures, and the other four are online, and you can listen to them. And they've been very informative about all of this. Uh, critiques of Lapidus' work and his, the dislike of Lapidus and all of those things, but nobody really talked about the DNA of Lapidus. And so since I worked with him, I thought it would be important to share a DNA of Lapidus if I could, so I'm going to try for the first time. Okay, so we're starting with the spotlight on the fact that Florida and the environment is what really changed Lapidus as well. So I want to say that I don't think that we can miss out on this connection that the environment makes architects or we, we as architects respond to the environment. So I think one of our lecturers spoke highly about how Florida is underrated in its architecture in the world and misunderstood. But I think the girl in the bikini and then the, the bathing suit, the bathing beauty and the uh, sunsets of Florida are themselves convincing that there's something really powerful going on. Okay. And then um, Morrison himself, I realized that American taste was being influenced by the greatest mass media in terms of the time, the movies. And so he was very keen on watching the movies, and he felt like he was producing sets for people to experience things in. Most architects at that time are not becoming what we would call later phenomenologists, but they were there, <laughs> right? The phenomenology of architecture. But Lapis was one of these people who came from the theater background, so all of his, um, so his architecture for him had to have an element of the dramatic, and he also had to make sure that his people were front and center. So Lapis designed buildings from the inside out, and he imagined that he was doing set designs for this movie producer who was doing this fabulous vacation for these fabulous people. Even Steve Wynn in Las Vegas remarked that um, the fountain will avert the concept of the hotel as a show. Basically, he broke down the fourth wall and made people the entertainment, and this was very unusual. Um, this indicates that um, many of the things that were learned in Las Vegas were really first learned in Miami Beach. So I think one of the things that we've been trying to um, do in this series is sort of understand um, how many things in Miami Beach really were novel at that time. And we can credit ourselves with that and, and be more um, be more proud of the things that we're preserving because they really were in the first here. And we should be more careful how we cradle that past because we really where you come from is where you go. So we have to cradle that in the air. Okay, so next one. That's why I'm trying to do it this way. This is okay, form. Everybody knows this is not supposed to be stupid, but this is supposed to be very serious. I try to, I mean, how the F are you going to understand that? Because it's too much almost. But if you can break it into parts, um, form is something that all architects deal with. The other thing that we always deal with is use of it. So you have the form, you have the use, and then we always have circulation, not just circulation in the building, but circulation outside of the building. 
So Lafters was always very aware of the FUC and where he's landing the building. But he would do it with these, um, with these remarkably kind of like 12 simple, this little flower. He would say at the very end that, oh, I, I love graphics. I love light. I love color. I, I make sure columns go, um, go away. I, I make sure that the stairs float. I make sure that the people love curves. Um, people love ornament. They need ornament. I'm going to give them lots of it. Lapidus would study the paths that people would walk on, the edges that he created, the nodes, the districts, the certain intentional nonsense that could be called landmarks. These things began to be the spiral that made Lapidus a dynamic design to give. So the question mark is always where does it go, and the exclamation mark is how delightful the view is there. So in a way, I'm trying to decode this symbol so that everybody gets some of the DNA. But always look for those kinds of elements in that. There's graphics, lighting, color, columns, stairs, curves, ornaments, the paths, and the way you get through space are very important for that. And the form use and circulation means the big box. OK, the next one. So the spotlight is on lapis, but I think there needs to be a little bit of a prologue, so I have about five five mini um, many slides for the next one. Um, cars and the beach would not have, the beach would have existed without cars, cars without Florida, without cars. We can thank, we can thank Ford for putting middle class America on the road and giving us the overload of cars. Next one. Um, what people, few people know that um, Carl Grant Fisher also built the Dixon Highway, which came down from Mackinac, Michigan, all the way to Miami, ended at 15th Street, came across the bridge at 17th. And that system of roads fed those cars that were coming down in the 1920s to Miami Beach because he too said, what the have I done? Miami, you can't reach it. What have I done? I better build some roads. And he had just come from building the Lincoln Highway that went from the Lincoln Terminal in New York all the way to California. So he's like, okay, I'm going to build a road system through America. And he invested a lot of time and a lot of effort to get eight different states, eight different governors, with two different men underneath them, a Congress of about 50 people to organize 5,675 miles to land in 1915 at the doorstep of Miami at the Venetian Bridge. That then was a wooden bridge coming across the bay. You can imagine in 1921, when all those cars were rolling in, that this was the spot. That was Miss America in New Jersey. And so then this is now Jane Fisher. The way it's told in Jane's book is that she had had a child. She, the child died. She was still of a stomach, a very rare stomach um, condition. She was very depressed, and she wanted to go to the water and just learn the Australian crawl and get the body weight off. And at the same time, she cut, she got the scissors out, she cut her dress off, she took her stockings off, she took her shoes off, and she went to the beach for that universal comfort that a mother can understand. And she jumped into the water and she swam in this outfit. Well, the pictures hit the pulpit. And at the pulpit, everybody was saying, Sodom and Gomorrah in Miami. And everybody said, we have to go. <laughs> we have to be there. This was really Jane Fisher. From 1950 to 1926, Jane really was the queen of Miami Beach. And we really should have this statue somewhere on Miami Beach. And from uh, the next, and so they reigned and they ruled and they built the city from 1912 when they first put the shovel in for Lincoln Road to 1915 when they began building to 1926 when the hurricane came. They had created a city out of the sand in that short period of time. And more than two million people were coming to visit. And then the big wave, the big hurricane hit. And so 1926 really, really, really stopped that first wave of style, which was the Mediterranean style that you see in um, Carl Fisher's work and you see the hurricane. This is what Miami on Fifth Street looked like after the hurricane. Carl Fisher was already over leveraged in Montauk. He was building Montauk, he was building Miami Beach more than Montauk and Long Island. And he set up 
He said, I'm over leverage. I can't, but whatever we can rebuild, we will rebuild, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do a lot of it. So, the next slide, please. Now we have Carl Fisher's envision for the city is there. He has the idea, but now you have other people coming in. And in this particular case, Pop Serkin came in 1933, a Russian immigrant, and so did an architect. I know, I, I'm sorry, I'm trying as loud as I can, if you want to move forward, but anyway, the um, Pop Serkin is, is this guy right here, and then there's um, Igor Polovitsky, who would now become the architect that would take over from the designing of what would be the next Miami Beach, and he, he liked the streamlined style. So that's um, 1933 to 1945, these two men are going to sort of start owning the most property on Miami Beach, and this style of uh, streamlined style of Polovitsky is going to become popular. Okay. So Miami Beach is a unique environment. Pop Circuit would say it's the best climate in the country. Let's see if we can make it good to live in. And so let's see if we can make it good to live in. All this is possible. Uh, the style story in Miami is really kind of with Lapid is engaging. He came from Bob Arts training, and then he would have seen the Monroe training from Art Deco, and then he would come to Miami, and this would be where he would get his, his um, the wave that he would bring to the mid-century modern wave on top of the street life. And preservation in our city shows those distinct areas, and we can all kind of look at that. So, Bob Serkin and Igor Polovitsky, though, they were going to work together to take advantage of the environment and they're going to use that streamlined modern style. And that's what we come to. When we come here, we love looking at, our, looking at our Art Deco. This is really like the second step of Art Deco. The next 10 years, from 1933 to 1945, when Polovitsky would be designing and all the other designers would be designing, they would be doing it in this streamlined modern style. You would see the change would come when Mr. Lapidus would come to China. So, Morris now is going to come and he's going to be a hotel doctor. He's not going to be the one that's going to be signing and sealing his line and an architecture that matches, right? But they have been saying that Morris um, did the interiors, and I'd like to let everybody know that Morris did more than the interiors. When he worked on these projects, he started with the interiors, and then he worked to the outside, and it was sort of, they sealed his drawing designs. And I think there's proof of that in some of the old newspaper clippings that show Lynn style, and they show the map of the So there is, um, his fingerprint was all over these five projects. As he was boxing and adding his sense of understanding style with this, um, with these deco masters. Okay. So what Baptist really knew about Miami was that cars, roads, and neon were kind of like the experience. He bought himself a convertible Thunderbird, and he said, "This is how you have to experience Miami." And this is the Miami experience at that time, right? And we're on the edge of making everything really fast. It was the age of speed. If you don't know it, Carl Graham Fisher also started the Indianapolis Park. So the fact is, is that Carl was addicted to speed. But the day the speedway opened, as a matter of fact, Haley's Comet went across the sky. Oh, I mean, if this was not an omen, I mean, things were going to get really fast. And so that's kind of what Lapidus did, was he kind of brought New York down in the 40s and what's happening in New York jazz. All that jazz, all that noise, all that difference, all that change. And you're going to start seeing that I think the jazz age affected the architecture and allowed us to break it apart and play with the parts, just like you play with the composition of jazz. So this is another very American invention. Jazz is very American. We have Jane Fisher cutting off her her bathing suit being half exposed. You have uh, Lapis coming down here with the jazz in his mind and the freedom to do what you want. And wow, it hits my Okay. So 
now we're going to get to laugh at this is DNA if I can. Okay, so next one. Oh, we, um, these are his hotels that he worked with, hotel doctoring. And that story is out there in the lobby. And you can go and look at that story, so I'm not going to repeat it. But what I do want to tell you is that he designed all those works. Lapis designed all the topography, all the, you know, he was the guy that liked to it. So when you look at the Biltmore Terrace, when I would go to the Biltmore and I see the pictures of the Biltmore, when I'm reminded of he put a lot of cowhide in there. There was, <laughs> he put a lot of cowhide in the chairs. There was always a thing. So the Biltmore always, I think if he was in like this cowhide, they themed his hotels, right? So because he was the first one to kind of say, I'm gonna get a theme about this thing and we're gonna figure it out. I think the Biltmore kind of was like the farm. But um, the San Susi was not. That was all about curves and all the way from the interior where he has Caglioli, which was marbleized in columns, all the way to the floor that squirmed, and all the way to the pool that curved. Everywhere in um, the San Susi is where the curve hit the wall and he did something. The Algiers is a um, sheer head of thought. I mean, this is just like a Arabian Mountains. Lapidus is going to have fun with this interior. Um, he's going to have tiles, he's going to have color, he's going to have things that look, you know, in the color of here. The Toledo, if you can or cannot tell, that is a, um, the Toledo Islands and all of those, when Jane was looking at the area at the Flamingo Hotel, she said to her husband, I'm flying to Italy and bringing back gondolas. I hope you don't mind. Uh -huh. And he was like, I don't even know what a gondola is. But he brought, she brought back the gondolas, and it's to Jane Fisher's credit that we have the gondolas in the bay. And all the men that had helped build the beach and build all the buildings were now manning it. So you see these. <laughs> Jane Fisher wrote a great book where she describes all these little details. But the fun thing to know is that Morris is even on the Domino here. He's making that look like a boat. And so when you, you'll see when you see the um, the logo that he made, how it looks a lot like a boat. Excuse me, uh, I hate to interrupt. Did, he, did Morris do all the fonts? Yes, that's why I said he did the topography. I mean, uh, he did all of this. So, like, the Nautilus has a star in it. I only see that as, like, the North Star, the polar axis, you know, the way you're going to get through the water. I mean, you know, as you can see, when you go to um, that particular Nautilus, it's a column after column after column. It reminds you of being like in kenosis. It reminds you of being in Greece or something. You know, like just these marching columns and then the Nautilus star, the pole star. The fountain one is all French, and everybody gets that part. They even walked was inspired from Italy, and he went on a shopping spree to go to Italy, and, to, and that was from the Eden Rock Spa where he went, and he actually wouldn't touch the rock itself, and um, in, incorporated into the Eden Rock more materials that he bought and purchased in Italy on a huge, uh, the map is here, right here, where he shows all the places he went to to purchase things for the Eden Rock. So of all the projects that Lapis did, the Eden Rock shows the most um, influence in the absolute substance of the material. The materiality of the Eden Rock is really pure talent. And then the Americana, you'll see, and I'll show you later, that Morris, at that point, he saw the Americana as a gateway to the Americas. It was going to be where the OAS was going to be able to have their, they can have their conventions there, right? So he was really looking to all the different art types that were existing in the Americas, the South America, the North America at that time. And that's why he brought Anton Revergen in to do the mosaics inside of the atrium that he created so that he could show the American, the American um, statesmen on one side and then the explorers on the other side. And this would be a cyclorama, it would be a total experience that would explain the, um, the making of the Americans. Okay, so he did design it. So the Algiers is where I'm going to start because we don't have the Algiers anymore. So I just wanted to show you that he's, um, and I don't have a little red clicker thing, so I'm just going to, sh you know, the pylon that you see going up that's green, you see the Algiers, the support on top of the pylon. You can see that he's kind of putting fins inside the windows. What people don't notice when they're looking at Lapidus, this is gone now, but this is an eyebrow that's on top of the window, and this is a balcony that's outside the door. So Lapidus is playing with things, and you're going to see these scales and playing with things. So in the DNA of Lapidus, on these exteriors, if that were still here, you're reading them almost like they're exactly the same, but they're not. One is an eyebrow, 
what is about me. And they're on the side of the pylon, you know, this big, this big tall. And he's taking advantage of the curve of the um, Lake Ann Coast at that point. And the whole second level now is this big sweeping, sweeping curve with these, um, I guess, you can't really see it from there, you'll see it in a minute, but he had a floating um, canopy that came out. Can you go to the next one? There you go. Oh, so, you, so you can see that this was curving with the, with the water, curving with the water, and this is like projecting out. And he's not doing anything minor here, he's putting a room on top of it, he's putting a community room on top of it. So not just is it a little, it's not just a little demure, little balcony that you walk under. No, now he's projecting it out. It's a whole community room. It's become a lighted center at night. It's almost like that's like a node, a corner, a minute. People are going to see that when you're driving down the road, for sure. What is the Algiers that's torn down? The Algiers was torn down when um, the owners of it decided that they wanted to put the Triton there instead. And so the Triton, it was in 81. It was in 81. Yeah, it was about in 82. It was about, I was going to say, it's in the recent history that this building was torn down. And it, I thought it was one of its more spectacular buildings. If you've lived with it, then you would have known that it was. And so, uh, the next slide was see the pool. So, this is kind of uh, Lapidus's idea of um, starting to get the exterior mixed with the I mean, the interior and the exterior are sort of blending. Where you can, you're going to see that the phone is going to give you a way to look into what's going on outside. That is going to basically turn the, the side of the inside of the of the hotel into a postcard to the exterior. So this was the Algiers when you walked in, and this was in chartreuse with four different shades of lime green. Was what happened is And he's got the, do you remember it? Do you remember it? Or maybe yeah. not. And then these are floating marble boxes that come out. And I think Philippe Stark heard a lot from Lapidus on these lamps because they were very young. Floating, triangular, only three pockets of tripod lamp, as a matter of fact. And um, all of the chairs that you see, they look like pillows with points. It's, it's quite silly, actually, but beautiful, beautiful detail. Okay, the next one was the San Susi. This was uh, the first one that he did, so I think he was uh, beginning to box the, um, the exterior. And this building is still there, you can still see a lot of these features. And so the little um, cheese hole that's on the edge, do you see the, the little cheese hole here? Just a little whimsical, and he's breaking outside the box so that people are going to see that lighted corner. And they're going to know that corner. He's projecting further. He's lifting the building up. He has this incredible pylon of green with the same Susie on. So that when people are driving, they can see this. It had to be bold. So um, he's taking the elements from the store design, 22 years of the store designer with Ross Frankel. And he's saying, what am I going to do? I'm going to sell a good time. And I have to, it's showmanship, man. I've got to make this building, I've got to make it wow. I've got to make people see it. So he's studying how he make people see it. He's striping the windows to make a bold statement with the windows. And again, he's lifting the building and putting more of an emphasis on the second level. First level, second level. That was the picture in the uh, newspaper. It's the only one I can find when it opened. So, you know, what we have today, I'm going to show you the, this is the, the egg crate that you can see right here. That's very strong. And this with the tile that was very strong. That's, this is how you can read the DNA of Lapidus. I'm trying to help you see the difference from the architect, from the streamline and the art deco, and hope that you can see it got jazzed up with Lapidus. And he loved it. He threw it at the, you know, he made curves work. And he also boxed the box. And he won with that. Okay, next one. So this is when you were to see the um, novelist, you're going to see that, aren't you? Anyway, you're going to see something. So that's kind of that's that's what you're that's what you're looking at. And there's the original Wolfies. There's the second floor. So you can see that he's competing with a lot of guys, but he still has his bold lines of the windows, and he has his pylon going all the way up. That's bright green. People are going to see that. Next one. 
So this is what we have today. Architect Furnica did a wonderful um, restoration of it. I just want to quickly go through it. You still see the green um, here, right? The green part one is still there, and this uh, egg crate is still there. And this lifting out, almost again, guys, the Nautilus is like the brow of the boat. Like, you see, okay, this is the polar north star. This is the Nautilus. We've got water going on here. And when you go in, you've got the marching columns. It's very, a very nice interpretation of uh, aquatic architecture without it being a steam, a steam liner. Okay. Next one. And this is again, I love this turn up of the end of the mouth of the canopy. And the star is not straight, it's on an angle. So. Uh, it's almost like a wand. Okay, the good witch is here. All right, another fabulous thing that he did in New York was he worked with glass block. He was one of the first ones to work with glass block in a little store called Wallace. And it was a shoe store, and they wanted to be able, they were on the corner and they needed to have them, people see where they were. He did a whole column in light out of glass block so people could see that uh, entrance. So here at the, underneath this, this pylon, he puts in columns, and then between this, he's weaving this line of um, glass block, which is just brilliant. I mean, when you see it, you're like, oh my god, that is so architectonic. But did they learn from that? It's like that biting, the etching, the gripping, the mashing together, and you know, the extra little um, uh, detail to uh, this, this plane has to flush out against that plane. All these nitpicking things that architects talk about that really actually do make the volume read better, they do make the, the architecture read better, and they really do make a stylistic difference. Lapis was not, um, was not uh, going to let any detail go unturned if he could make it have a dramatic. He wanted his buildings to do something to him. So he was finding the littlest things he could do. The next slide shows, shows even more. Morris, is, uh, Morris would build in these diamonds into his projects. And so that you get sort of inside, outside, inside, outside. These diamonds are weaving inside and outside, inside and outside. On the inside, the terrazzo. On the outside, the planters. And architect Onik has left that there, and there's also a glass wall that goes right through them. So the outside to the inside, it's just a very, very wonderful uh, detail of that. This is the Nautilus is one of the most special buildings, I think, for the fact that um, you can see some of these details so quickly, so quickly. Okay, next one, please. On the interior, there are columns. Why do they need to be so big, guys? They don't. They don't. Latin has always overscaled the columns and put rings of light at the beginning because what was the biggest thing in the 50s? Defying gravity. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden you have the Russians are going to, to into space, right? And everybody is going to defy gravity. Well, Lapidus is sure to do the same thing. And he's defying gravity. You go into this building and you don't even realize that you've got 20 stories of, of, of uh, you've got a tower over you. It's light. And why is it light? It's because of these rings of light at the top of the column. He's basically dematerializing the space and creating this experience of light. And the next, the, the next slide is the most unimpressive stair of Lapidus, but I still think it's so nice that it's there. And it's the beginning of where the fountain blow will go. But you see, he's working around the curve. He's working with the curve. It be, it's going to be interesting. I'll show you another one where other designers worked in a different way with the stair. So Lapidus has always decided, I'm going to work my stair with the curve. On this one, he's working into the concavity of the and you'll see how they vary, but always look for a stair. Next one, please. So this is the interior of the Nautilus. You see the ceiling line, you see how the walls would have gone up higher, and they give this idea of floating. I think that Architect Nautica continued that very well, defying gravity and making the whole appearance to be very low. Next one, please. Okay, the shell board is usually not, is not out there and not represented. And it's, the reason it's not is because it's done outside of the league of, of this. Um, <laughs> it wasn't done in the same time period. It was done after 57. And we wanted to talk about the big eight. But I wanted everybody to know here that Morris did do the entry to the Shelburne Hotel. And so if we can look at that, I'll show you that. This is the side of it. And no, that's OK, good, because I want to end it. This is where Kolovitsky is, is ending. And Polovitsky is here, and now Latin 
this is going to be taking on. And what you're going to see is when Lapidus puts his building in, remember that, that tie, that diamond that we're talking about? He's now forcing the facade to go in and out so that when it's, when it's lit at during the day, that's how it looks because the edges are going in and out. So it's not that it actually moves. So it's very, I think it's very interesting that um, you know you, you can study Polovitsky versus Lapidus very clearly here. And so I'm not going to belabor it, but don't look at it one day and you'll see what it does. Polovitsky winds up looking very flat, and Lapidus actually looks like he's moving. And it's a very interesting play of light that's very subtle. Okay, next one, please. So that's just again, you get like a, the thin feeling right here from um, Polovitsky, where he's doubling it up and it's very heavy, and Lapidus is going to lose that, he's going to make it a little bit lighter, and he's going to make bolder these elements. So Lapidus is already kind of like, he's leaning up the machine, he wants this to sell, <laughs> and he's going to lean up the image so that you can get the most bang for your buck on every piece of stuff that you've got. <laughs> okay. Next one. So, and of course here in Shelbourne, when you put the circular entry in, and the columns, they are, if I, if I had a crown here, you would have to see that they poke up like a little crown. So I should have brought a crown, because they do. The little things poke up, and I don't know if you know it or not, but Miss America was at this patch. Was here. The Miss USA was held at this, at this particular um, uh, facility. And go to the next one. I think this is, you see like there's the, you yeah. see the, like the little poking up, like the little crown is coming up, and then you see on the side like the crown is down. I think it's a very fun, punky little game of Lapidus's to put in that symbol, which I'll tell you in a minute where it's all coming from. Next one, if you can. So there, I'm just, he's in love with the curve on this one. He's in love with just the simplicity of like the crown. The Nautilus is his neighbor next door, and he's been very different, right? He's like, he's, He's battling against himself. From the square, he's going to the curve. I mean, this is very nice. You can see Lapidus in the neighboring building right there next to each other, how politely and respectfully he's playing with himself, with one being very square and one being very. It's like the ginger problem with Frank Gehry, you know, where he has like Frank and Ginger on the Berlin building dancing. You kind of, I think of it like that, where the, where the um, Nautilus is the straight guy and this one is the long guy. Next one, so all that. Right? And when you're when you're there, it's very nice that the wall comes in. And go to the next one. And there you see him on the floor. And he's not going to do that much to the interior because Polovitsky has like already this lobby in the back. And so Matthews is doing a very great job, I think, of um, also on the floor heading back. Go to the next one. And that's his very modest stair going downstairs to his lodge. Next one. And this is Polovitsky's stair. This was the original lobby. And if you understand the difference, you can look at Lapidus. Lapidus would never put a column from a curve. He would never do something like that. That would just be like so anathemic to the way he thinks about putting a column in a, in a stair. The stair would wrap around the column somehow, or would flow with the column. It would never be hidden behind him. So this is a very different gesture that uh, you can see very clearly. But it's a beautiful stair. I mean, if you're there, this is one of the most sexiest lines you'd ever imagine. But because the column is there, guys, you never see it. It's just so funny. Okay, so next one. Point A. But this, okay, so now this brings us back to the leader, which was another project of this. And this is an early 1940s picture of what Miami Beach looked like in the 40s when Ross Brown Fisher's house is here. And that's his lovely house that stood the hurricane. And this is um, the Seabury from the Goodyear, AKA the Goodyear residence. So his tire, I mean, that, I mean, Fisher is all about parking. He knows everybody from the spark clubs to the top to the end. I mean, everybody's, everybody died. I mean, Allison, everybody was all. So anyway, this was good here. His best friend is going to come down, and his best friend is going to be right next to him. Okay, so now it's going to get built into the middle of the top. And that's where Pop Sirkin comes in. He has only so many rubles in his pocket. You know, he's from Russia. He's just finally making his money back from the stock market crash in 1929. He's coming to Miami to live his wounds with a little bit of money, and he's being careful. 
And the first thing he says is, I'm going to put an Italian country bathroom. So the first thing he puts in is this town and country thing with Paul Levinsky, so that people can come. It's called Town and Beach. And people are going to come and bathe. And they're going to have a lot of fun being at the Town and Beach club. It's a banner for everybody. But in his mind, what he's really planning is the office complex and the hotel. And he's doing all this with Paul Levinsky. Paul Levinsky actually, and so Paul Levinsky designed the bathroom, uh, and he also designed this building. The problem was, by the time he got to do the hotel, Paul Levinsky developed a rare skin disease and had to move to Arizona. So he's out of the story. This guy Grossman comes in, the architect, and says, I'm not doing this unless Lapidus does the interior because everybody likes Lapidus. So Lapidus has a job because the um, hotelier says, I'm not doing it without Lapidus. So now Lapidus is going to do the video. And I think the way you can see, this looks like a gondola. I mean, I'm not making it up. If you look at that, that looks like a wave. And then what he did, which is brilliant, he bent the concrete behind it so that when at night it lights up, it looks like it's just a haze of floating light. So it actually looks like it's floating in a mist of water. It's fabulous. So if you haven't noticed in the video, please notice that little gondola. Oh, you want me to? Okay, well, to orient you, this is, this is the town and country thing that we're talking about. So this will be the video. This is the temple in Emmanuel. Does that help you? This is, this is Lincoln Road. And Topsu can also develop the Albion. So the Alveon, I think, is in this picture. The Alveon Hotel is back there. Does so that help you? It is the beach at the bottom. The beach is at the bottom, right, because this is the beach. Yeah, the beach is here. Are you oriented now? Yeah. So this is the beach, and this is Lincoln Road, and this is the town and country. This is the town and beach club, and this is the Domino Club. That's it. Across the street, on the left. On the right. That's it. On the left, yes. And by the way, it was, it used to be that he angled the building. Do you see how he angled the building, Polibinsky? He did that so that he could get the prevailing winds. And, um, and so that kind of that angle has lived in the DNA of that project since the very beginning, but it was to get that, and also to get better views to help him come. Next one, let's see. Okay, so this is what we have today with Lapidus, um, like with Paul at the bottom, layered with Lapidus coming in and being sensitive, being an L-shape building around it, and then the final layer of this being done by um, John Nichols in 2003. So I've lived through these, these variations, <laughs> at least the later ones. But wait a second, do you see here what I'm talking about with the Toledo kind of floating? <laughs> if you see this at night, it really is quite magical the way the Toledo looks like it's floating, but it also puts a shadow underneath it. So you do get this real magical sense. And in the original drawings, you can keep going, I'll show you, there are originally two lines in the So there's the Toledo again, as we move. And there is a Nautilus at the bottom. And I think it's nice that you, that's the shell horn and the Nautilus. Where is the Delano? The Delano is right here. Oh, that's the Art Deco. So you have the Art Deco, then you have the Streamline Deco, and then you have like this jazz stuff mid century model, which is boxing with that Deco, with that Streamline style. It's three waves of styles that happened within 10 years of each other. Really, it's very interesting. Okay, so when Lapidus came and did the um, leader, that was the original mural that was on the building. Now we're getting into 20 minutes on the other. But he put a mural on that And again, the, they have honored it now by reinstalling it, and you can walk through it when you go to the restroom, but it's not, it used to be on the outside of the building. Next one. And during the life of the, this building, it's had these different things added to it. So I just thought I'd show you this. <laughs> Okay, so this was like the 60s. You know, they're trying to be brutal and big. Oh, okay. Next one. 
um, I thought that what that is did on this side, which is the um, the the Collins Street, the, 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 the canopy was wonderful, and then these two, you see these little bean holes that go up, looking like two rudders in the water? This is very interesting. Okay, so stay on that for one second. I just wanted to mention that, guys, if you'll notice, Mr. Lapp and I used to, we used to sit at Del Leonte and just watch how the sun would go, because for him, that was a great soleil. Those uh, windows actually angled in. And those, uh, that egg crate is creating a, um, a shadow pattern so that it's creating a, a ripple in the facade. And during the day, it's almost like a time clock of the day because at different times of the day, you get different shading effects in that building because the rooms are, the new windows are angled in and then you have the projections. Can you see in, in this that these are angled? It comes from here and then goes back. Can you all kind of see that today? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly. And the second part of that, when it was originally built, it was only one story because Papa only has so many rupees, right? He's doing, he's very conservative. He's doing a little bit at a time. He's doing the bathhouse. He's doing the first story. And then he goes back to Polovitsky. Now it's at the second floor in 1950. And then fine, now we're doing great. We've got the offices of this big firm in there. Now we're doing great. Let's put the hotel on. And Polovitsky leaves. So we have what happens. So that, again, is uh, looking back. And you can see the shadow pattern effect I'm trying to describe on the Lido facade. And you see the all down in the distance. That was done by um, Polovitsky as well. And that was also done by Pop Circuit. At this time in the history of the beach, Pop Circuit owned more land on the owner than what any single owner. And he was one of the largest landowners on the beach. Yeah, and the okay. So we go back and more if you don't mind. I want to show you. I want to point out something that Bob Lapidus is designing the Toledo and these buildings down here. He's being asked to design this project. And this is Topa. And this is what the other area looked like. That was the parking for the road. There was no convention center. There was no. That's the Jack Gleason. Pardon me? Was that the Jack Gleason? Yes, exactly. Morris did that. Mr. Lapidus did the theater, the performing arts, which was the Jack Gleason. So, in a way, if you're looking at how did Lapidus also materially add his love of theater to Miami Beach, he added the comedy theater, and he also added the. Theater. He also did Gusman downtown. He did the Gusman on the University of Miami campus. So um, the, the involvement of Mr. Lapis with the arts is not just something that you invent yesterday. This was something that was so germane. I mean, his grandparents were the ones that did the uh, did the costumes for the Russian medal in, in Russia. So for him, I mean, Mr. Lapis had a bronze carrier that was golden, gold leafed, and beautiful. That's all the symbols that his grandparents and grand and aunts and everybody had used with the Russian opera. His love for opera was immense. When he died, he had every playbill from the performances in New York City from 1927 to 1949. And his music collection was amazing. I gave that to a friend to hold for me, and then I found out that he destroyed all of it. So I have to tell you, I walk. That is my one great grief about never let anything that's a precious to you go to somebody else. We have to be, we have to be super careful. The Lapis had every playbook. Okay. Pardon me, Collins Avenue? <laughs> well, Lincoln Road is this one, and it's still a road. And this is the 605 building, so this is, if that orients you, that's the 605. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be the all the on it, the video, the video at the end. Are you the green with me? So, Lincoln Road is Lincoln Road is here, and Collins will be here. Thank you. Do you see it now? Yes. And the theater of performing arts is here with the curving in, and nothing else. Okay, next one. Um, so, that's what we get today. We have the, um, again, the Sagamore and the um, the Lido and um, the work from John Nichols on this one. So I'll go faster. So that's in, I've got a lot of these little ones because I like watching how the light plays on the shadow of this building. So I, so this is looking at Polovitsky. When you're seeing Polovitsky, it's 
but I won't. At the end of his eyebrows, he's going to make it look like an orb. Okay. <laughs> That's called Levitsky making the end of the eyebrow look like it's, like it's an orb. Okay. And there's Lapis saluting that with his Delio side at the top of the column. So again, this is sort of where they're dancing with each other, which is very nice. The two buildings work well together. Next one. I like this detail so much. You see, I take 500 pictures of it. Okay, next one. But I do think it's remarkable that he would angle, he was so good with neon that he would angle the backdrop so that it looks like it's floating in the canyon. Okay, next one. And that's again, the, that's the entry at night with the way the light was being used. Light at that time, the streamlined architecture used light, black was continued that idea. Next one, I think I've got a lot to know. <laughs> These are the original interiors of the video. Again, you see the, um, the brick rack kind of pattern and then... Next one, we're never going to get these, I'm so sorry. And, um, that's the interior. And by the way, do you know what those circular things are on the, the walls? For real, they're hubcaps. They were hubcaps. He turned hubcaps into lights. Wow. For real, back in the day, they were hubcaps. Okay. That makes it so nice, right? Next, uh, there you go. This is what it looks like now. They kept the, um, the lighting pictures. I think they might have just modernized the material, but um, the, the look is still the same. And they have redone the stairs very carefully, and the floor have, has been carefully restored. And um, all of that detail in one of the map pieces. More of the stairs. The banister was amazing. Now we're at the fountain. Yes, that's the so Ritz Carlton, exactly. Sorry. Um, well, the fountain of Lowell Town, Miami, marks the birth of, uh, it marks the birth of Morris Lapis as the architect, okay? Now we're signing and sealing his own drawings. That's why a lot of people think that was his first project, but it really was not. Nor was it his first real building. He'd been building in New York as well and doing some projects in the Catskills. So, I mean, he was building the Borch Valley while he was building Miami Beach. So there's a lot of crossover if you want to do comparative stuff. The Catskills um, and compare it to Miami, those are two very interesting things. The things that hold true are pools. Lapidus learned a lot about pools and sliding in the Catskills that he brought back to the and vice versa. Um, so the philosophy of design uh, was founded on like all of the shop drawings that he did and all the shops that he did, but also this migration of ideas from the workshop shop into Miami Beach. And he said that um, this was a laboratory of design where he began to refine this mythical American landscape of consumering dreams, a consumable dream. And guys, here we find out. Lapidus this is not going to just hint at the fact that he loves bow ties and he loves diagonals and he's all about harlequins. He's going to tell you, this is my building, this is my signature, and I put my bow tie on the Now, you have a final that Lapidus has taken over, <laughs> and he's found his own symbol. So I'm, going to, I'm not going to show you everything about the fountain, but I'm going to go quickly through the last three. And um, so again, look at the stair though. I mean, Lapidus never would have done a stair the way that we, we saw Polovitsky do it in by the column and underneath it. This is the grand gesture that was for the, uh, just for the people to have a glamorous moment and glamorous interest. So the fountain book had David Hickey writes, nothing to do with luxury hotels of the past and everything to do with the luxury hotels of the future because it was the first freestanding building designed not just to house commerce but to facilitate it. People were going to come here, they were going to have a good time, they were going to put their money down the Um, this still exists. And by the way, go back to that last slide for a second. Of all the things in the building now that are still there, these are the only things original. And the stair. But that's original. And everything that's there, pretty much, that's it. Can you speak to the mural? Oh, the mural. Oh, okay. That is a, um, that is a, we would call that a scenographic. This point, right? Because it's a scene from a Russian, from a um, from a Roman ruin, 
And so it's something that moved to the Palladian um, watercolor or a Palladian wash. Now remember, Mr. Lapidus is trained in the Beaux Arts. And I said at the beginning that we go from Beaux Arts to, to mid century to Lima. We go from Beaux Arts to Beaux Arts. I don't know how we did it. <laughs> but <laughs> somehow, somehow Lapidus went from there to there, and he did it. I mean, but he's always giving this little nod back to where he's coming from, right? And so. This was really something from a Piranesi, I think that's a Piranesi, a Piranesi print, but I can't give you the exact answer. I can't give you the right number, but I can tell you the story. I gave, a, I gave a talk in Texas, Austin, Texas, talking about styles and talking about fashion. And I was having to speak for Mr. Lapis with Tom Ford, Todd Oldham, Bill Schofield, and Stanley Marcus. And I'm having to sit in with those men. It was quite a, quite a dance to be sitting on. And um, at that moment, when Todd Alden is showing his um, runway, out comes Christy, uh, Cindy Crawford with the Pyrenees print um, on her green dress, done it in 3,000 different beads from, uh, from like 20 different sources. And he took about an hour to talk about how he made that print in that dress. And so I tried to buy that dress, and he not to Cindy. I think Cindy. <laughs> I tried very hard to do that dress. But that is the print there that she also printed on that dress. So it's interesting to see where, where is Lapidus in pop culture. He shows up everywhere. He's not just an architect. He's an idea. This idea of this freedom, this idea of this movement, this idea of fun and delightfulness. Okay, next one. And this is still there too. That wavy balcony is still there. And the stair peeling away from the second one. That is also, I think, still there. And to go to the next slide, this none of this is there. And this is what Lapidus is remembered for and what he got all the belly who the belly who about was that people would wear gloves, they would wear their fur coats, and they would wear their diamonds, and they would sit and they would have their children sit rod straight and have lunch. This is this, none of this is there anymore. And the little um, this was the floor of the lever. So that's why you see little Fleur de Lis on the wall. And that's why you see the Fleur de Lis on the back of the chair. And maybe you can't see it, but there's a little Fleur de Lis right here. And these, he had a woman in the Candelabras. He had a woman in New York that he worked with CC, and she would design these things out of paper mache. And that is the Sun King himself, holding court on his little pedestal in the Fleur de Lis room with all these uh, light fixtures around it. So none of this exists. I don't even think this exists in an archive of the fountain. Okay, so that's that. But this does exist still, the curve of the building and the fabulous garden area things. And we know from our fossil that, what was it, Beyonce and Jay-Z were projected on that building, and she sang the river and the South Florida Symphony was actually there playing it. And so they have the projection of them on the entire facade. For once again, in one instant, on Snapchat and every day on Instagram, Lapis made it around the world with Beyonce and Jay-Z on the projected on the and singing the movie. And Tiffany projecting her name on the wall. So she's wearing all Tiffany. That was the Basquiat Tiffany, all this love campaign that was just done. So I put that in there so you might know to look that up. All right, so Lapidus is still used. Okay, this is the Eden Rock, and again, I guess this is the most like the steamship, but the pylon is there, it looks like waterways, it's like the filigree, it looks like it's from Italy. If you go through it, it's real quick. Anybody that, we had this at the front, which is very Venetian, it's almost like you could play with this, and you know, you could see this in Venice these little columns. And the balconies, I fought very hard in 2008 to keep the balconies because um, John Nichols thought they needed to get rid of them because of the last then. So we, I petitioned very strong at that time and the, the balconies stayed, thank God. Because I do think the balconies make this like little opera boxes to the theater, which is really the people in the world. So balconies was, again, giving everybody a chance to have their little moment in their little opera box. Did you win? I did. That's why they're still there. Otherwise, they were going to be taken out. Do you remember that? I remember the huge drumbeat, and then ultimately, uh, the, the 
the applicant just pulled it. That's right, he pulled it because, yeah, John Nichols just said, we're foolish to do this. I remember John said that to me, and I worked with John on the Delito. And so for me to be so, I got on TV that day, and we were doing those, I called my, everybody I knew it said, meet me there, we have to do this rush because they're voting it on this quickly. So I feel good about saving the documents. Okay, next up. And the other thing I wanted to share with you guys is that when that was, we're talking about style, so we want to see where things shift, and I don't want to forget that in the DNA. Latins, for the first time, had done something that no one else had done. He had done an x-ray vision of, he did the inside-out version of the top. That is not a balustrade. That is a wire frame of a balustrade. Okay, so what you're seeing here is made of wire. And it's all going down. Blake, in one of his things on postmodern, is where he said, this is really the beginning of postmodern. And what Lapis also did at the Eastern Rock was he took an agapanthus leaf pad and put it on the floor. He scaled it up to the larger size, which is a little leaf. went really big, really, really big, around the entire in, in center. And this, too, they considered punk, or they were considered postmodern at that time. So Lapis, in this building, Albeit trying to be the most severe Italian building, actually did a couple of firsts that changed architecture. So again, we see these. See, we can see these diamonds now, but now we see the hidden bow tie. Um, now we have to see the bow tie. Now we have to quit seeing the diamond and quit seeing the harlequin and how he's playing with the No, not the harlequin. Please start seeing the bow tie. So I'm trying to get you to flip your eye because now after we found the bow, he's going to go full hard on that. Um, and these were the gardens. And this is something that I wanted to really explain is that Lapis always thought that Miami Beach was about its gardens and it was very, very significant the environment and the Christian to work on them. And we used to come and sit out here because we would like to watch these little uh, sculptures that pee into the water. Because they, they're little bronze pond statues where they pick them up in Italy. And for him, when we would go there, it would be like we were doing a shopping trip. And he could tell me all the different places where he bought things. So this was quite a wonderful uh, thing. And that was sort of like a carousel, the little breakout room on the side. So I wanted you to know that he loved, loved, loved the Is that still a good? Oh, yes. Well, no, that part does not exist. That's why I'm showing it to you. That part does not exist. This part here, this part exists. This part, the balconies, because we, we made them keep them, but all of this is gone. Let's see the next one. So now we come to the Americana. And the Americana was. Um, I want to just tell you what Lapis wrote about them. I was going to read it, but I can't read it in the light, so I'll read it. I'll try to paraphrase it. When, when Lapis went to do the Americana, um, he told Mr. Tish, sure, I'll do it. And then he went away for a trip, for the shopping trip. And when he came back, he didn't like the design, but he showed the design to the Tish family. And the Tish family said, we want to think about this. Give us a week. And so he gave them a week. And Mr. Tish called him and said, where's we don't want you to do the project. And so he said, I'll waive my fee. He said, they said, we'll pay you, but we don't want you to do the project. And, and Mr. Lapidus immediately said to them, um, I'll waive my fee if you tell me why you're not letting me do the project, because it had already been in the newspaper that he was going to be the architect of the conference. And he said, I didn't want to lose this contract. So he went to his office. They're all in New York. He went to the office and said, Larry, what's wrong? Lapidus, it's not you. You know it's not you. And so they, he said, give me a week and let me come up with something. If you like it, then we'll begin again. And they said, okay, we'll give you a week. So he we went back and then he designed under the iron of you know, losing his project. And he said he really put his whole heart and soul into it. And he realized that what would be the greatest thing to do for the Americana was to give it an exterior environment unlike anything else. Miami Beach was not this. This was in Val Harbor. And when he built this, there was nothing <coughs> else around it at all. He said they didn't want the glamour of the fountain 
They didn't want all that fruit fruit of the human body. What they wanted was a real American building that they could enjoy with families and have families come to. They wanted a, they wanted a place to play in the garden. And that's basically what he said. So what he did was he created this incredible exterior landscaping for this project, which was his best landscaping ever done. And they agreed to the project, and they agreed only that he would not take any vacations. He couldn't, he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't let anybody else go up on the project. Nobody else could present the project. There were like 10 covenants. You know, you will get this job if and only if you only do this. And that was what he agreed to. So what, what year? That was 1956. So this is not here anymore because now we have the reaches is there. The San Regis. The San Regis. I'm going back to St. Regis. St. Regis and the Val Harbor. Across from the Val Harbor shopping. So the next one, but wait a second on that. If you can, guys, remember what he was doing with Polovitsky. Go back one. Remember what he's been doing with Polovitsky or what he's been doing with the Toledo, what he was doing with the now look at what's happening with those balconies. Not any one of them are the same. You turn one of them off. And actually, the, the men that drafted that for him, they said that was like the most confusing elevation to draw because it was always time when turning one off. Do you see how that is going? Okay, and it makes like a very interesting pattern. When Sir Basil Smith came over and saw the building, he said, it looked like you would rear up and bite me. <laughs> it was a perfect image. Um, it was a perfect alligator to it. Okay, so next one. But this is fine. The very plain side of the building. All of those are metal. That's a parking lot, but those are metal um, sunscreens that are blocking that, giving it some articulation and making it interesting. And the big round circle you see, we're going to see that pretty soon on the inside. That's an atrium that's 120 feet long. Next one. Okay. So it looked like a huge mushroom, a big terrarium. And, and when he first opened the building, inside the terrarium they actually had an alligator. Uh, they had an alligator stall. <laughs> anyway, but do you see the do you see the balconies from above and the very And that's Blackstone on the bottom. And then in this building there were no less than 14 artists hired. So what you're looking at, this this is metal work that was done by a woman. I can list all of them for you if I can read them. But anyway, just this was done by a woman. Um, Morris did the screen work himself, and um, you'll see in the next slide a few other details that I can pronounce. Here. So this was the um, screen that Lapidus did, that hanging screen. It was made of glass and bronze, and I think five different types of metal. I think he was had a Pac-Man. I mean, this definitely looked like some Inca thing or a Pac-Man eating. I can't decide. But anyway, that, that is a, I mean, if you read into the, uh, you know, it looks like just a flat screen and you start seeing faces. I don't know if I'm watching it too long. Okay, next time. That is the um, Bob Moss room. These are drawings of the carnival that were done by Anton Refarge. And Refarge is going to also be the artist that does the um, mosaic, does the mosaics in the This is downstairs. This was another artist that turned all the columns into these Inca. Remember, this is the Americas, and so he has Aztec, Inca, he has all, you know, Mayan, all these different types of motifs are being worked into. And if this is way before art in public places even existed as a thing, right? Art in public places did not exist at that time. So he's um, hiring 14 artists with the budget given by petitions, and he's making this a real true center of the arts. Next one. So this is the exterior. That was a bar that was floating outside. It reminds me of like a little boy's boat that they float in the water. You know, it was a very playful gesture. He had at the um, Fountain Bowl, Kitty Cat Pool, where the balcony, I mean, where the swimming board was the tail of the cat, and then the kids would jump into the Kitty Cat Pool. He did whimsical things like that. So this is like always to me like a little bit of a Okay, next one. Um, these are just showing you the interiors and the different colors. And also, if you look in the back over here, this is cow hide. <laughs> Maybe you can't see it, but these are cow hides that are stretched on, on a rope. 
Is there another slide that might show the closest? Yeah, there it is. This was the gaucho room. And when Mr. Lapidus designed for the tissues, he created something called the gaucho room. It was in all of them, in all the other towns. And so there's your gaucho room. That's not a Remington, but anyway. But, um, but they did have different people designing the screens and also designing those elements, and also the bronze room, not a Remington, but a Next one. So this is Lapidus doing the uh, Cup of Havana room, and that's how it was waving, and he has put above the bar Thousands of fake flowers that are in a, um, they're all, they're all cloth flowers, but they've all been pressed in chicken wire. So that what you have suspended above you is a huge thing of flowers. And that's what you're experiencing in the bar. And if you'll notice these um, mirrors, they look like they're like just these Rococo mirrors that are just, that was done by a man by the name of Gideon, and Gideon invented this sculptural paint that would allow you to make this. One. And it's in the shape of a piano. I guess I didn't say that, but it's sort of like in the bar is like almost in shape. And then there is a piano behind the screen. There are all these beads that hang down. It's very, very sweet. Next one. That's what a room looks look like. And I think at the American it was the first time. I know for a fact it was the first time we had a a toilet and a bathroom set. The toilet was here, and then you walked outside, and it was in the sink. This was the first time that this had been done. And that was invented that year. So, these were the demolitions, and they found, they were tearing the building down, and um, so they saw me up, and they found the mosaics. So, that's one of the demolition shops that they threw, and that was in 2006. And this is what the mosaics look like when they were still on the floor. Next one, please. And those were all destroyed? Well, no. These, no. George Perez was under agreement with me that I would say that they should tear the building down because Lapis thought you know, all the artists were had already been destroyed. I said if they found anything that was existing from the past, they should keep it. And in the spirit of Lapis, we should save it. And so when the workers saw this, and if, if they opened the wall, they stopped the construction. And then they called me in, and we went in with lifts, and we looked at everything. It was all in good shape. And for three weeks, they had workmen come in and cut out the mosaics and save the mosaics. So the mosaics happened. Wow. Where are they now? Well, that's, the, I went to Tallahassee trying to find a place for me and going to Tampa and everywhere else trying to locate them and Tallahassee accepted them, but they've been there for 10 years in storage. There's nothing been done with them. It's at this point, they, they, I think we should start asking them. We should ask to get them back. If anybody in this group wants to start that, I'd be happy to do that. Next, next slide, please. So what I wanted to say is gardens have always been a really big attraction in Florida. So remember, we've got the sunset, the bikini, and the other world. So those are Florida. Everybody sees that, we know that. Um, and so Morris, when he designed Lincoln Road, he did it. If you go through that quickly, uh, this is the first pedestrian mall in the country. I don't know if y'all know that or not. In 2012, I was able to get it on the National Registry of Historic Places, so it has been um, put on that registry. But it's been put on as a landscape with architectural features contributing because they felt that the landscape really is what made it so incredibly special. So Lapidus did say when you designed the road that it must be a garden. People wanted to have that, um, like a central park. And he actually got the guy from Central Park to do the lighting. So the lighting, um, the lighting stands that we have on the road were the same guy that did it on Central Park. So there's Lapidus saying, "Your car never bought anything." Wait, Carl would love that, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, covered everybody, and with that, we sold the city on, on doing their own taxing district and on creating a uh, Lincoln Road Association that they would pay for it themselves. 194 merchants said yes, they would. And it was supposed to go beach to bay, but who owned the bay side? The servant. Who owned the beach side? The servant. Do you think they were going to close the streets? The servant did not believe that this project was going to ever be successful at least not for 30 or 40 years during his lifetime. And he was pretty much right. He left 
but it is successful now. But for the first years when it was being built and constructed, he owned four properties on more property on Lincoln Road than anyone else. And even the ones on the interior of Lincoln Road, he sold immediately. He said, I don't, I'm getting out. If you're putting in the mall, I leave. So the pops on the Next one is um, next one is what it looked like when it was a road. And this is what it looked like when lamp was put in. And so um, in 2004, when they redid Times Square, what did they borrow from us? Our black and white stripes. Our black and white stripes. So, I mean, if you don't think Miami shows precedent in many things, I hope tonight at least you come up with some of the DNA that has been exported out of Miami. And that really is, we can own that. That's really us. And so Lincoln Road with the black and white stripes, and you see that in the And by the way, Times Square is where Carl Fisher had his Lincoln Highway. So here you have the Lincoln Highway, you have the black and white stripes. It's almost Carl in the mix again. It's nice. Next one. Um, that's happening on Lincoln Road. That's in my business card for 25 years. <laughs> Crazy. Next. I, I stood in for him. That was the entry fee that Lapis wanted there. I would wish that we could go back to that. It would be better than the Jersey Wall they have. But, uh, but Lapis did have the same kind of idea that, you know, it might need to have some structure there. But that's what he had with the class. So I don't think that's a bad idea. And he had those three circular information kiosks that were destroyed to allow that roach to go in. So, um, okay, times, the times change, styles change. Next slide. Um, now these are all old vintage Lincoln Road pictures before we overcrowded into the tunnel. Uh, it used to be a tram. Yes. I didn't have a picture of the tram, but I do. Yes, I can show that when you saw it. Wrong. Um, just like there used to be cable cars all on Miami Beach, Carl Fisher brought cable cars in. And so back in the early day, I mean, he's all into getting people moving around. He's all into movement. And he knew to make a beach, so he had cable by the way, Carl Fisher put in the infrastructure of Miami in 1915. The infrastructure was put in. We get dredged. It was the first dredging permit in Florida for dredging a island from the bay. And so, I mean, Carl Fisher, the first, first, first thing for sure that was given to Florida is that Carl Fisher had the first permit for dredging the bottom of the bay to make a similar floating island. That's really remarkable. After that, the dredge became a symbol of us, but not but not before. So the cable cars were they actually like Yeah, they were electric and they actually were. And there are pictures of them there were that. I mean they look very fascinating. He was the one that set up the um, electrical pile, the little island with all the electrical stuff. He's the one that set that up. Did they exist in the middle of a hurricane? Yes, exactly. 1926. Ooh. He can't come and rebuild. He's already over leveraged in Montauk. The banks take over everything here, and then you have people coming in and buying up the banks. Next one, please. So that's the original plan. It's still there, the original logo. Still there. I like the science. And the, the lights are still there. So, And that's, by the way, there's a plaque about Mr. Lapidus that we put there, right here. There's one little plaque that talks about Mr. Lapidus. We have the right because it's been put on the National Register. We have the right to ask for a bronze registry uh, plaque, but I have not found anyone that wants to pay for that. <laughs> but people, I mean, I didn't do all that for myself to get it on the list. Why is it not going to pay for the sign? Okay, next one. Um, so this is the kind of gardens that Lapis gives us. You know, he gave us the Fountain Club Gardens, and none of that exists anymore. Um, he gave us the um, Piermark Garden of the Sussexes. He gave us the little fountain at um, the, where is that, the Botanical Garden. And he had it with, yes. um, he had put um, red brick all on it. And so when the gray jungles, they didn't like the red brick, so they, they, um, they took off all the red brick. And now they just have that. But they do have a note saying we built the house. But they brought it down to its very rustic crew, and they took away the, um, a beautiful veneer that you put on to the red room. I thought they could have made it gold. Cool. So nobody else. But anyway, that is um that is still there. So the gardens that are not existing are not the, the 